Again, Shabbat Shalom. If you don't know me by now, my name is Marcel. I'm one of the leaders here at Messiah's New Life Tabernacle. And again, even starting with that, we are a congregation that is led by a pluralistic uh, type of leadership. We don't have a senior pastor. We don't use that, that model. Um, we, we follow the model that our Lord, um, he, he, uh, when he left this earth, he left the leadership of the, of the congregation in the hands of his disciples. And they were, it was called the Jerusalem Council, and they together made decisions. They together um, thought of uh, the problems and, and, and gave judgment. And so we, uh, we use that model. And it's a beautiful thing. If somebody gets sick, if somebody dies, um, we, don't lose a, we don't lose a step. We, the next person steps up. Whoever has that gifting, we allow them to use their gifting. And so that's what we do. Today, I have an interesting message to give. Um, you might hate me after this. Uh, you might throw something at me. But I'm going to give it to you anyway. Um, you know, we hear in our politics, we, we hear in the news, identity politics all the time, right? Identity politics. And, and, and according to the culture of today, I could identify as anything I want. I can identify as a 13-year-old female. It, it would be funny, but people are doing this. And people are saying, I identify as a 13-year-old female, so I'm going into a women's bathroom. Not on my watch. But, but they are trying to, they are doing it. And it's called identity politics. Well, I thought about this because in our, hmm, in our walk, we also have something called identity theology. I coined it, identity theology, in that we use terms, and, and if I use a term, you may not understand the meaning that I'm bringing forth when I use a certain term. So if, if I say the word Christian, uh, let me try it. Anybody want to... Give me your definition of what a Christian is. Anybody? What's your, what's your definition of a Christian? A follower of Christ. Good answer. Anybody else have a different or another type of answer? Yeah. A church goer. One more. Nobody has a definition of We use this word all the time, don't we? Julian has something? What? I see you starting something right there. You, you, I don't get that guy. Take him out of here. He's starting something. Just take him out. See, okay, so we have definitions, and I, I believe they all um, are accurate. But we use these terms. We use the word church. And, and what do we mean by the word church? People? Mm -hmm. uh, can, I just, can, can, can I just mention, though, that word is not in the Bible? So what has happened is the people who, and I'm thankful, let me just say this, I'm thankful for those who have translated the word of God from Hebrew to Greek to other languages and into English so I can understand it for myself. But there is bias amongst, there has been bias among the translators, and they have put certain words in our scriptures that weren't there in the original script. And we can go back and look and see what word was there. For example, the word church wasn't there, but the word assembly or called out assembly was, or congregation. Now, in Hebrew, it's called kahal. In Greek, they would say ekklesia. There's a word called Gentile. That word was never in the original script. That's a word that was placed in there by the translators, and it has a certain meaning and it means, if you look at the definition of, of Gentile, you know I've got an is issue with this word Gentile. Um, it means a pagan without any knowledge of God. I'm not going to allow anybody to call me a Gentile. That's not who I am. The word that's used in the scripture is goyim. And it simply means the nations. Other people other than the Israelites, the Am Israel, other than them, it's the other nations. And so, goyim, and, and the singular form of that, goyim is the plural, goy would be the singular um, version of that, of that word. Um, there are many of these words, and we throw these words around in our Christendom. 
we throw these words around, and I assume that you know what I'm talking about, and you assume that you think I know what you're talking about, but we could be miles apart. So I wanted to take today and just look at certain hmm, topics. Can we do that without getting mad? Okay. All right. So when I grew up, I grew up in a Christian church. My mother um, it was an immigrant. She was uh, from West Coast Africa, and um, she was from Liberia. She's passed away now. But she, when she came, um, some Baptist women from the South, um, they, they raised money, and they brought my mother over to America where she attended college, um, became a nurse. And uh, if you've been raised by a nurse, I pray for you. It's tough. You, get, you don't get much sympathy. Let me just tell you right there. If you call, fall down, cut your leg, yeah, yeah you're not going to get that sympathy. Anyway, I digress. So anyway, my mother raised us, um, brought us to a, uh, I think originally we were in a Baptist church, and then we ended up being in a congregational church. Um, and so every place I've been, there's always a little difference between this denomination or that denomination. They believe this, but we don't like that, so we're going to start our own denomination over here. There are thousands of denominations, thousands of them. And so depending on what you identify, some of you might identify as a, as a Christian today. Some of you still might identify as a Catholic. Some of you might just say, I'm a Protestant or I'm an Episcopalian or I'm a Baptist. Or... And I want to kind of delve into this a little bit and, and, and talk about this. Um, the thing that I had a problem with when I was growing up is that I would read my Bible, believe it or not. I would read it and I would read things and I'd go, the Bible says this. But then I would hear people teach and they go, the Bible says this. And I go, whoa, that's not what I think it means. It means this. And it's called a cognitive dissonance where there was this, mm, the, the pastor would say it means this, but I'm reading the Bible and the Bible says, no, it means this. And so I was always told that God loves everybody. And you're all going to heaven. Because, because God's a God of grace and he is a God of grace. But then you read a scripture like this, and it says, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the, the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. Okay, we can all agree on that, can we? Yeah, huh? And many enter through it. So it's indicating that many people are going down the wrong way. They're going down that big road, right? That leads to destruction. But here it is. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And here's the part that got me. And only a few find it. That's some scary stuff. Only a few. So what does that mean? Um, when my pastor said, everybody's going to heaven, everybody's going to be forgiven, you're forgiven, you just say, I love Jesus and you're good. Um, this says few find it. Mm, got a little problem here. Then, then it was this description. This was never taught in my, in my church. No one ever attempted to even mention this in Matthew. It's in the Brit Hadashah in the New Testament, we call it. This is Messiah. Messiah said, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of, what? Uh, is that a misprint? Because I never saw that scripture. Uh, there's a problem here. I'm a congregationalist at that time. I, is that me? Uh, who is the lost sheep of the house of Israel? These are questions that I had that caused me a lot of angst. Then I was always told in my Christian environment, that when I die, we're going to heaven and the streets are paved with gold. Matter of fact, I went to many funerals where a pastor, he didn't, he didn't even know the deceased, but he would say, oh, Julius is in heaven right now. He, he was crippled here on earth, but now he's in heaven. I'm like, how do you know that? Where does it say that in the scripture? And then they say, and there are many, even today, there are many songs that say that earth is not our home. Heaven is our home. I go, is that right? All right. It, but, but then let's, I started examining. So what's the meaning of the Hebrew word Adoma? Have you heard of the word Adoma? So Adoma is the word for mm, earth, soil, dirt. And here's a list of, of words that in Hebrew this word is derived from. So you got Adam. His name is 
not Adam, it's Adam, taken from the word Aduma, because he was taken from the dirt, taken from Aduma, so he's Adam, and it means soil, and there's another play on Hebrew because Adam means red. So this guy came out of the dirt. I guess you would be red or brown of some, cor- some form if you came out of the dirt, if God formed you out of the dirt. And so you have this play, and so it says, Then the Lord formed the man of dust from the ground. So mm, he's, he came out of this ground, out of this terror. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living person. Pretty much scripture, right? That's scripture? Yeah? Yes? yes. Uh, okay. Uh, and the man became a living person. The Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. So, I don't know. Maybe I'm just a simple man. It says that, okay, let me start again. I'm from New York. I, I was born in New York. So when people say, you know, where you're from? I say, I'm, I'm a New York. I'm a Yankee. When I live in the South, people will always call me a Yankee because not where I was living, it was where I was from. I was a Yankee. I was always going to be a Yankee. And they, 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 I think they use that term as a derogatory form, but I thought it was great. Yes, I am a Yankee, dude, dandy. I'm a Yankee. And so <laughs> according to the scripture, man was taken from the earth, from earth, from the earth here. This is home. Right? You still with me? This is home. Right? So, what are these songs that we keep singing about? The earth is not our home. Heaven is our home. I'm going to come back to that. Then there's this, this word called the Torah. Um, some of you, because you've said it to me, you have a problem with calling it the Torah. And... Um, I think you're more familiar with the term Holy Bible, right? But I, I, I have taught already that before they had a the canonization of the scripture, before they put it in a binder, before any of that, centuries before, when God first instructed man to write down his holy writ, it was written on a scroll and it was called the Torah. So even our Bibles today... You don't have a Holy Bible unless you have a Torah. And so you have what we call the Old Testament. It's called the Tanakh and the writings of the, the, the prophets. And then what, you, what we call the New Testament, that phrase is not even a good, it's not a good, it's not a good testament. Uh, uh, it's not a good word to use, uh, New and Old Testament. God's word is, is, is alive and active. It doesn't die. It doesn't get old. But this guy Marcion coined this phrase about old, the God of the Old Testament, he's a mean God. He was killing everybody. And, but the God of the New Testament, he's nice. He, he walks around with the sheep on his shoulders, and he's a good guy. And he got the Old Testament and the New Testament. We don't have to worry about the Old Testament. That's not for us. We, we just have to worry about the New Testament. No, I, I don't believe that. So you have this word Torah, and it's the living word of God whom the Messiah is. The Messiah is the embodiment of the Torah. He is the living word of God. But again, we as believers, if, you, if you've been in the Christian you know, environment, this is what you think of when you think of the holy word of God. This is what I was raised up on. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm just telling you, this is what um, we believe when we, when we think about the word of God. But back in Yeshua's day, not everybody had one of those. Not anybody um, could afford um, the written word. That's why they met in synagogues, because it was so expensive to, to, to create. It took years to create a, a, a Torah scroll. Let me raise something else, and I've already talked about this, so for those of you who already know what, what I've said in the past, I, I've raised the question, how old is the letter J? It's, I, I'm not asking for an answer, but... In Hebrew, there is no letter J. There's no letter J in the, in the Hebrew language. And that's the language that the scriptures were originally written in. And so I had to ask the question, yeah, how old, how old is it? I'm about to answer that question for you because it's important. Because for a while there, the Bible was not offered to the average person. Um, the average person was illiterate back in the, in the middle centuries. 
And uh, the first Bible, one of the first Bibles that really was groundbreaking was the Geneva Bible in 1560. And it was called the Bible of the people because it was written in, 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 in plain language. It was the Protestant Refor- Reformation that this, that this work came forth. And then after that, as a mm, response to that Bible, then came King James, who he uh, inspired some men to come and translate it. And I have this Bible, by the way. So I'm going to tell you right now, if you want to, I'm going to pull it out of my, I brought it here today. I, I, I went looking for this Bible. It's 1611 edition. And in the 16 edition, uh, there is no letter J. So when you read the scriptures, there's no John. There's no Jerusalem. There's no Jacob. There's no Jesus. There wasn't a letter J invented yet. Does that make sense? And so the thought hit me, well, if there's no J, does that mean nobody ever called him Jesus in his lifetime? No, nope. when the Messiah walked the earth, did anybody even call him Jesus? Because that's not his name. And the letter J wasn't even created until like 500 years ago. Just things to think about. And then I thought about this. What do Christians believe? And again, I'm, I, if you want to identify yourself as a Christian, and there are many different kinds, like I said, you might say, I'm a Christian, I'm a Seventh day, I'm a, you know, uh, a Baptist, I'm whatever. You can identify what you, you know, however you want to be identified. But I, I asked the question what really identifies a person as a Christian? So I made a short list. Can I make a short list? I can make this thing probably 20,000 pages long, but I made a short list. It says, I, I, usually a Christian says they believe in Jesus Christ. They believe that he's the Messiah. And that's a good thing, right? Yes? Yes. Okay. Uh, usually Christians believe that Christ died for their sins and was resurrected. That's a good thing. Catholics, they, they like to really honker down on the death part of it. They always put them, leave them up on the cross. I'm like, listen, folks, he came down off the cross, all right? Um, Christians believe Sunday is the Sabbath. The ones I'm, when I grew up, we always went to church on Sunday. I'm still a part of a a congregation. I go on Sundays to a Christian church and help some friends of mine lead worship over there. And they meet on Sunday. And they call that the Lord's Day. But they also believe, and I hear this pastor friend of mine when he teaches, he says, the the Christians there, they, they believe that they're not under the law. They're being taught that they're not under the law. And I think, hmm. And, and they believe that they are under grace. And that's, this is, I'm, I'm speaking in general terms. This is general, general terms. I'm not trying to be specific about exactly everything that everybody says. Um, but then you have this scripture by the Messiah. It says, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And again, here's another word, fulfill. That word in our culture, we think it means to bring to a completion. I fulfilled the task. That's not what it means in Hebrew. He did not come to destroy, but to fill full of meaning. That's a good way to think of it. For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot nor one tittle will by no means pass from the law until all is fulfilled. Well, I have a question. Is heaven still here? Is is earth still here? No, no, I'm serious. Is heaven and earth still operating? Yes. Well, then he didn't destroy the the law then. He says it, his own testimony. But let's, let's talk about this. And I love this part. Christian holidays. And there are a plentitude of them. We've celebrated everything in, in, in the Christian church. Everything from Mother's Day to St. Pat's Day, anything you can think about. Um, I lived in Denver. We even celebrated when the Denver, you know, um, when, when Denver was playing. The Broncos were playing a game. Everybody dressed in their jerseys. And we had Denver Day. Well, Christian holidays. What are you laughing about? This is serious. So I, this is just a short list, short list. You, if you can identify with this list, okay. Christmas, 
We celebrated Christmas. We decorated the, the boughs with bowls of holly, and we put up Christmas trees and lights and, and, and put up fake pine spray and all that stuff. Christmas. And then we have Palm Sunday, uh, the day that Christians say that Christ rode in to Jerusalem on a donkey. And then Good Friday. I don't know what's good about Friday. I never figured out what was good about Friday. I don't know what. Anyway, then you had Easter, Lent, Ash Wednesday, Monday, Thursday. I mean, there's so many. And Halloween. We celebrated Halloween. All Saints Day, you know. These are Christian holidays. Let me ask a question. Are any of these prescribed? Are we commanded to observe any of these festivities in the Bible? That's a, that's a problem. Because through my research, and probably yours also, we've discovered that Christ was not born on December 25th. He didn't come into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And you, you'd be hard-pressed to get three days and three nights between Friday and Sunday. But the Messiah told us that this, here's the sign. It's the sign of Jonah, who was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights. And you better know what a Hebrew, how a Hebrew calculates a day to even understand that. But look, look at this in Acts 11. It says, and he left for Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. Because I was always told that, you know, we had some status because in Antioch, that was the first time that believers of Yeshua, of Jesus, were called Christians. It's in the Bible. Well, it says here, and when they had found him, they brought him to Antioch, and for an entire year they met with the church and taught considerable numbers of people, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. If you've got a Christian Bible, if you've got a King James, that's what it says, or you've got a New, King, uh, a New American Standard, that's what it says. And you do realize that our Bibles are a translation, correct? So you have to ask the question, well, what was that word Christian originally? What did they translate from this word to the word Christian? Because I was told that the church was started in 30 AD at Pentecost. That's what I was raised. And when I went to school as a pastor, I was told this in seminary that, yeah, the church started in 30 AD at Pentecost. I don't come back to that one. But let's finish this. So the disciples were first called Christians, saying, you, you get a complete Jewish Bible, it says something different. It says, then Ornaba, Barnaba, yeah, went to Tarsus to look for Shaul. His name is not Paul. Did I mention that? His name is not Paul. I'm going to come back to Paul, too. I got a lot of comebacks, too. His name was not Paul. His name is Shaul. And when they found him, they brought him to Antioch, and they met with the congregation there for a whole year, and and taught a sizable crowd. See, the word church is not even there. They met with the congregation. It's an assembly of people. Also, it was in Antioch that the Talmudim, the disciples, for the first time were called messianic. The reason why you use that word messianic because they were following the Messiah, whom, they, whom these Jews believed to be the Messiah. And you say, Messiah, messianic. You're a follower of the Messiah if you're a messianic. That makes sense? Then there's this guy, Constantine. He was a pagan slash, some people believe he was a believer. And he enacted certain laws in Constantinople. And this was like three or 400 years after Christ. And so he uh, did some good things, did a lot of bad things. I'm going to get off of him. I've got some other things i got to discuss. I'll come back to him if we need to. So we talked about Christian beliefs. Let's talk about Jews. What do the Jews believe? Because, and I could probably list 18,000 things that Jews believe. This doesn't have to be, you know, everything that they believe, but that there is one God. They believe in monotheism. 
They believe in one God who is the creator and Lord of the universe, that God has a special relationship, the covenant with the Jewish people. And some Jews just believe it's just with them. That if they are faithful and live by God's laws, they will be promised a place in a perfect future world. And they depend on that. That the Messiah, a great leader from God, will come and will bring a time of peace, fruitfulness, and security to the world. So, you know, a lot of these Jews in the first century, yeah, there was some discrepancy amongst them whether Yeshua was the Messiah. But the deciding factor was he did not overthrow the Roman Empire. They were expecting a conquering king. And when Messiah didn't do what they thought he should be doing, they disavowed him as Messiah. And they still look to this day for the Messiah to come. They haven't received, I'm generalizing, Jews are still waiting for the Messiah to come. And to them, you know, who is Yeshua? Who is Jesus? And I got to tell you this quick story. I had the privilege of going to, to Israel in 2004 with my daughter, one of my daughters. I went as a chaperone. And being a New Yorker, we don't know any strangers. I jumped off the tour bus, and the first thing I wanted to do was find me a Jew man. And I want to ask him some questions. And the first question out of my mouth, I found this older gentleman and ran right up to him, ran out of the bus, ran up to him. I said, sir, I said, sir, what does Jesus mean in Hebrew? Because I knew, I knew the Jews, their names meant something. It had meaning. So I asked this guy, I said, hey, you wouldn't think I would have known this by now. I grew up in New York. A lot of, a lot of friends, a lot of classmates were Jews. I never thought about it back then. But I said, today I'm going to find out. I said, sir, what does Jesus mean in Hebrew? He goes, and he gave me the disgusting look, you know. It means nothing. I, I said, what? I said, it means nothing. It is not a Hebrew name. It means nothing. And he briskly walked off. And I was devastated. I was like, what? What do you mean it's not a, oh, it's not a Hebrew name? So it wouldn't have a meaning in Hebrew. Most Hebrew names, they have a meaning. There's some, there's some kind of definition behind it. Well, Jesus is seen either as an extremist false messiah or a good martyred Jewish rabbi or teacher. He was a good teacher. They'll, they'll, they will admit to that he was a good teacher. Many Jews do not acknowledge Jesus at all. Jews, except for Messianic Jews and Hebrew Christians, do not believe Jesus was the Messiah or the Son of God or that he rose from the dead. Orthodox Jews believe the Messiah will restore the Jewish kingdom and eventually rule the earth. So again, they don't believe in, as a whole that he's even come yet. So you got the Christians, you got the Jews. And then we have the scriptures. So I, I kind of, earlier I talked to you about Christian holidays. Now I want to talk to you about what the Lord deems as a holiday or a feast day. He's given us seven of them. And this is in English, but you have Passover, but in Hebrew it's Pesach. Then followed by unleavened bread, which is hagamatzah. Then first fruits, bikarim. Then usually you always see Pentecost. That's not Hebrew. That's, that's a way of describing the 50 days in, in, in Greek. You know, pente, you know, you, you have this 50. Well, it's really Shavuot. Then you have trumpets, yam teruah, that's the blowing, actually. And then atonement, yam kippur. And then you have Shavuot. Uh, no, I'm sorry, Sukkot uh, for the last one. And believe it or not, the Sabbath is also included as one of the feast days, as one of the Moedim, the appointed times. Um, I found this, this graphic. And you see where it says trumpets, and you see this arrow going up? You know, uh, yeah, that's alluding to something else. I know I'm doing a lot here today, but that's alluding because there are many people in Christendom that believe that one day we will be raptured. And I've spoken about this here. The rapture. And they use this scripture, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, as a proof text. They'll say, then we 
which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And that's true. The scriptures claim, and it says state, it states that when the Lord comes back, that the dead in Christ will rise first, and then those who are alive at the time of his coming will be changed, in a twinkling of an eye, will be changed, and then we'll be caught up in the air. But my Christian church taught that that's when we go to heaven. He's gonna, we're going to get caught up in the air and go to heaven. It doesn't say that. It just says you get caught up in the air. But my church and my assembly growing up, I was taught that we're going to go to heaven and escape all the judgments. Because when God pours out his wrath, see, the church is going to be taken out, and, and he's going to attack those no good Jews. He's going to give them to them because they killed the Messiah. That's what I was taught. But, you know, we have an example, a thematic example from Exodus. When the Lord wanted to introduce himself to the Egyptians, that's how I describe it, he was able to pour out judgment and at the same time save his people. He was strong enough to protect his people and pour out judgments. So why would he have to pull out his people now to pour out his judgments. I, I don't see that. Um, as a matter of fact, I had a problem with this whole rapture thing because that word's not in the Bible. That word is never mentioned in the Bible. So how did we come up with that? And that's a whole other subject. But then they use this Matthew 24, 40. Then there will be two men in the field. One will be taken, one will be left. And I've heard this many times. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, one will be left behind. And I bought all the Left Behind series books. I had the whole library. I, I, I mean, I spent a lot of money on that. I, I bought the hardbound you know, uh, books. And uh, Tim LaHaye, they... Uh, Again, in my Christian church, we, we taught that one day we will be raptured, going down the road. Only thing left is your BVDs. You, 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 you get taken up right out of there. Um, your, your dentures are sitting there on the, on, the, on, the, on the, you know, gold teeth. Just But that's it. You're gone. It sounds kind of dangerous if you're driving a car. But then there's this. Again, we sang this song growing up. We all get to heaven. What a day. Hey, yeah, we're going to go to heaven. And, uh, that, and then even contemporary, there's like groups like uh, Building 429, and they talk about this is not our home. You know, they sing this song. I, I like the song, but I don't, I don't believe what it says. Then you, because you have this kind of scripture. And I was always taught we're going to heaven. But then it says here in John 3, 13, no one has ever gone into heaven. I'm going to say that again. It says no one has ever gone into heaven. Now, it's not me saying it. That's the scripture. How do you deal with that? Except, oh, there's an exception. Except the one who came from heaven, the son of man. So let me get this straight. In the beginning, in the beginning, when God first created man, he took him out of the dirt, breathed the Ruach, Ruach HaKodesh in him, placed him in the garden of Eden, boom. And then it says that the Lord would come down in the cool of the day and teach him, talk to him, instruct him. And, and that one day the Lord is going to restore us. But man never started in heaven. How could that be home? He never was in heaven. So how could that be home? Home was the earth. We were taken from this. And we say, when we die, we return back to earth, right? Ashes to ashes, dust to dust, right? Then you have this in Revelation. This is the culmination of this age, by the way. It says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Wow, no more sea. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. Now, this is new because God's dwelling place was always in heaven. God would come down from heaven in the cool of the day and talk with Adam and Eve. Now it says, 
Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. And we won't even need any street lamps because the glory of God is going to be so glorious that we're not even going to have night because he's going to be glorious. So God's coming down here. He's building this new Jerusalem. He's bringing it down from heaven to dwell on earth. And so wherever God is, isn't that a form of heaven? I, I, this is my proof text um, against, in lieu of, in spite of everything I read about the rapture. Um, this is one place that got me. The scriptures talk about the Messiah would come and he would speak in parables, and the Lord used a lot of parables. But this one place in Matthew 13, the Lord gave this parable, and this is one place where he actually told the parable and then gave the explanation of the parable. You, there's no guesswork here. And he says, so just as the weeds are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. So we're talking about the end of the age. And, I, I, you know, Brian Burris, I always mess with him. We, we, we talk during the week. And he's supposed to be retired. He has a different way of thinking of retirement. I'm trying to, I'm trying to do some intervention with him. But he, he's doing it wrong because every time I talk to him, what are you doing? Oh, I'm out in the garden. Well, I was, I was tacking down a tree. I was cutting the grass. I'm like, dude, you're doing it wrong. You're supposed to be retired. But he's always weeding his garden. I'm like, how many times can you weed a garden? He has three gardens. Can I, can I embarrass you? He has three gardens. Is that correct? Am I telling the truth? Yeah. Is that right? Is that a head shake? Okay, thank you. Yeah. And... and, and <laughs> He's always weeding the garden. He's always weeding. And I asked him this week, I said, why do you weed the garden? What's your answer? Why do you weed the garden? To keep it good. To get rid of the weeds and do away with the weeds so I can help grow produce. I don't know why I said this. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good answer. That's true. Okay, so, so, so look at here now. And I thought about you saying that, and I thought about this. It says, the Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks, and those who commit lawlessness. Tim LaHaye and them said the people getting raptured are believers. My pastor told me I would get raptured and, and I would forego the judgments of God because I'm going to be taken out of here. And this is the Messiah. He said the Son of Man will send forth his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom, out of his garden, all weeds... That's my words I'm putting there. Stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness, Torahlessness. Those who commit Torahlessness, because that's a translated word, law. The word is Torah. And they will be thrown into a furnace of fire. In that place, they will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's an idiomatic term meaning she -hole. I don't want to go in this rapture. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> The people getting taken up first are not going to heaven. They're going into a place that's prepared for the devil and his angels, where there's gnashing of teeth and weeping. Then it says, then the righteous will shine forth like the sun in the kingdom of their father. The one who has ears, you better hear. Let them listen. Let them hear. Okay, so that threw a monkey wrench in my whole theology because I was told one thing, but the Bible says something totally different. Then there was this scripture. It says, every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Here's that metaphor again about the garden. If it's not planted by God, he's going to root it up. It's like Brian's garden. If he didn't plant that weed, he's going to pull that weed up out of there. Huh. Here's another one. I got a kick out of this. All right. Who's that? Come on. You can say it. Who's that? Come on, say it. Who, 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 who? That's JC. Who's JC? What do you? <laughs> so everybody can say that they've probably seen this this rendition. Uh, this is supposed to be a rendition. I don't know how they got Jesus to sit down for this portrait, but they <laughs> they got him, and he sat still, and he and they took this picture of him, and and just drew this this portrait of him, and and he's notably has long hair. 
it never bothered me before, but then I realized he's got long hair. And, and, and he looks Caucasian. Can I say that? Because he's got blue eyes and he's got a real, he's got, he looks European. I don't know. He looks goatee, you know. I guess. Now, anyway, okay, so this is a rendition, a portrait of, of Christ. So my question to you is, did Christ create Christianity? It's a simple question. It's an honest question, isn't it? If Christ came here with the intentions of teaching us his ways, did he create a religion entitled Christianity? What? Oh, you people, I don't know. You guys probably didn't go to catechism. Well, here's another question then. Was Jesus a Christian? Well, what was he? He was a Jew. He was a Jew. He was a rabbi. He taught in a synagogue. But we have portrayed him as a European-looking, long-haired Christian. And then some pictures have him looking like this. That's a, that's a very common picture of him. I'm not, this would be funny, I'm just saying this is how we depicted our Messiah. It's no different than me showing you a picture of a black Messiah, a black Jesus, right? Yeah, yeah they, got, they got all, everybody, everybody wants him to look like him. You know, you know, it's interesting, every time you see the Messiah, he's looking handsome. Even the movies, The Passion, he looks handsome. That's not what the scriptures say. He was homely, you wouldn't even notice him. It took Judas to pick him out of a crowd. Listen, when I brought up the fact about his long hair, if you don't understand history and culture, in 1 Corinthians 11, it says, Do, does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it's a disgrace for him? In the, in the Hebrew, in the Jewish community, in their culture, it was unthinkable for a man to have long hair. And I know what you're thinking. What about Samson? Yeah, Samson once took a Nazarite vow. He was dedicated, and so he didn't cut his hair, and that's where he got his strength. But every other person, every other Jewish man in that community, they did a couple of things. They never, um, they never wore shorts. You know, they never, they never walked around town showing their ankles. That was a disgrace. So when you read about the story about the the prodigal son when the father was waiting for his son and he pulled up his robe and ran. Ooh, that was unthinkable. They didn't have long hair. I can go into more detail, but there's certain things culturally that men didn't do. And one of them was they didn't have long hair. And it says in Leviticus, do not cut the hair at the size of your head or clip off the edges of your beard. So can I just say that the Jews living in Israel right now, they don't even look like the Jews that were there during the first century that were taken into Babylon. Can you think about this? The Jews that were taken into Egypt even, they mistook Joseph for an Egyptian. How do, how do you do that? If Joseph was looking Caucasian, like that picture, how did they mistake him for being a, an Egyptian? The Egyptians and the Israelites they were very much, they look a lot alike. They, they the Semitic tribes, and they kind of look a lot alike. The Jews living in Israel right now are Jews that have settled there from Eastern Europe. That's why they look the way they do. So you got to really rethink all of this. Might this be the way he looked? He didn't cut his hair or he cut his hair, he didn't cut his hair on the sides, he looked Jewish. He definitely didn't look like that first picture I showed you. He wore tallit. And it says, there's a prophecy that said the Messiah would come with healing in his wings. And when I put on a tallit and I put my arms up, it looks like I have wings. And we know the story about the woman with the issue of blood. She grabbed on his tzitzit and, and, and power flowed from him, and he, she received her healing. 
So Yeshua is the living Torah of God. And I'm not, I'm not going to unpack that. I got too much stuff to still unpack. The Apostle Paul. Most Christians, at least in my studies and the school I went to, Paul was credited for writing most of the books of the New Testament, what we call the New Testament. And um, basically, he's revered amongst Christians. And, and, and they call him Paul. And um, it kind of irritates me that we have taken and we've kind of basically kidnapped certain persons from the Bible and made them what we think is more plausible, more appealing. So we've taken this man and, and said, oh, he's a Christian and he is the writer of the New Testament and we live him. And so let's hear what Paul says about himself. Can we do that from the scriptures? This is in Philippians 3. It says, for it is we who are the circumcised. And this is another term for being Jewish. The circumcised are the Jews. We who worship by the Spirit of God and make our boast in the Messiah Yeshua. We do not, we do not put confidence in human qualifications, even though I certainly have grounds for putting confidence in such things. He said, I could boast about it, but I don't even do it. If anyone else thinks he has grounds for putting confidence in human qualifications, I have better grounds. Anything you can do, I can do better. Yeah, this guy has some serious qualifications. And he says here that he was circumcised on the eighth day. That's what that word means. He was circumcised on the eighth day according to the custom of his elders, of his people, of his culture. By birth belonging to the people of Yisrael, from the tribe of Benjamin, from Benjamin, a Hebrew speaker with Hebrew-speaking parents in regard to the Torah, a parush, a Pharisee. You ever think of Paul as a Pharisee? He's saying, in regard to the Torah, a Pharisee. In regard to zeal, a persecutor of the Messianic community. We know about that. In the beginning, he was persecuting the church. The church. In regard to righteousness, demanded by legalism, blameless. That's who Paul says, or Shaul says about himself. He was the eighth generation, I think eighth generation of Pharisee. Do you think about Paul in, the, in those terms? What? He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was a rabbi. Yeah, Paul had some credentials. All right, I know I'm messing with your theology right now and your identity. You know what this is? Anybody recognize what this is? A calendar. Most calendars... This is how it's set up, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And the Lord already told us in his word that we are to remember the Sabbath day to, by keeping it holy. And it says the Lord worked six days and on the seventh day he took rest, right? And it says here, therefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a, a perpetual covenant. It is a sign, it's a, it's a sign between me, meaning him, and the children of Israel for a couple of days. A couple of weeks? Oh, forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Hmm. It's a perpetual sign. It's the sign that you are his. Okay, so the Sabbath is forever. The covenant that he made. He's a, when he makes a covenant... It's forever. His law, oh, his Torah, it's forever. His word, yeah, it's forever. And then there's a blessing involved with keeping the Sabbath. If because of the Sabbath you restrain your foot from doing as you wish on my holy day and call the Sabbath a pleasure and the holy day of the Lord honorable and honor it, desisting from your own ways and from seeking your own pleasure and speaking your own word, then you will take delight in the Lord and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. There's the blessing. If you observe his, his Sabbath. Rhetorical question. Yeah, the Christians believe that, and I believed growing up as a Christian, that Sabbath is Sunday. Uh, but even the Catholics, this is in their own documents. It says, which is the Sabbath day? This is 
asking the Catholics. And the answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Oh, so they know. They know Sabbath is Saturday. Why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? So that's a great question. If we know Saturday is the Sabbath, why do we observe Sunday? We observe Sunday instead of Sabbath, instead of Saturday, because the Catholic Church in the Council of Laodicea, 336 AD, transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. So again, men getting together, had a council. There was a lot of anti-Semitism. There's a lot of reasons why they did it, but they, just said, they decided that God gave them the ability to change the dates and times, and they decided to change the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. Why did they do it? Why did they substitute Sunday for Saturday? The church substituted Sunday for Saturday because Christ rose from the dead on a Sunday, and the Holy Ghost descended upon the apostles on a Sunday. That's questionable. Question, by what authority did the church substitute Sunday for Saturday. The church substituted Saturday, Sunday for Saturday by the plentitude of that divine power which Jesus Christ bestowed upon her. What does the third commandment command? Third commandment? They got that wrong because in, in the Bible, it's the fourth commandment, right? But they say it's the third commandment. The third commandment commands us, I can't read it, to sanctify Sunday as the Lord's day. woo -hoo. That's why. And I'm going to tell you something. The Catholic Church says if you observe Sunday, then you are basically under their jurisdiction. Because you're observing Sunday as your Sabbath. You understand that? Yep. Mathis, do you understand that? Okay. So the Catholic Church is the church that spawned the Christian church. The Christian church didn't start before the Catholic church. The Catholic church gave birth to the Christian church. That's one of the reasons why um, Martin Luther, you know the story about him nailing the theses to the church door. He was reading the Bible and he, he discovered some things. And, and then you have, boy, I can really go through this all day, but there was this idea that um, um, some things were just not right. And so he, he, as a Catholic priest, um, objected to certain things, almost was killed behind it. He did, not, he did not like Jews. Can I also say that? That's in his own words. And then um, from his movement, you had the Lutheran church. So there's a lot of, lot of uh, planting coming out of this Roman Catholic church. There were 84 Sabbaths recorded in the, in, the, in the scriptures. 84 times that you can find that um, the Sabbath is described by believers observing the Sabbath, including the Lord. And he reasoned in, in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. Um, this is not something new. So the reason why I'm showing you all this is because people ask me questions about why do we do Hebrew? Why do we do these things in Hebrew? Are we trying to be Jewish? And I say, no. We're trying to go back to our roots. We're trying to observe the way the Messiah taught us how to observe. We're trying to please the Lord because in the beginning there was one language. You know the Bible talks about there was one language, one holy tongue. And then at the Tower of Babel, the Lord separated those languages. Well, there's a prophecy that in the end days that those many languages are going to come back to one holy tongue again. He's going to restore that. And I guarantee you, well, I'm betting that's going to be Hebrew. It would make sense. I was going to tell you about the sacred name. Um, I don't have time. I've run out of time. But, you know, even in our midst, we have people who identify as sacred namers. And uh, they want to restore the, the name of God in the Bible. And I'm all for that. There's a problem, though. The, the, the rabbis of old did a great job of um, protecting the name. So much so that we don't know how to pronounce the name in this day and age. 
And I've talked to many people who have spent their lives studying the subject, who have doctorate, double doctorates in, in biblical um, linguistics. People even like you know, Brad Scott, who, who came here and taught. Um, nobody knows how to pronounce the name. We say Yahweh or Yahweh or Yahushua. Or Yah uh, there's so many ways to pronounce it. Uh, Iowa, um, Josephus, he was, he was a witness. And he was from, uh, he was actually a Levi, but he was a historical witness. The historical works of Josephus, he described that the, that the Levitical priests, they wore a turban. On a turban, there was a gold band. And on the gold band, there were four letters of the Tetragrammaton, the four letters, yod heh vav -He, And they were pronounced as verbs. Each one of those letters was pronounced as a verb. I can't do it right now from memory, but it sounds totally different from what you might, hear, might have heard. And then there are other people that are going around trying to tell us that uh, the way you pronounce it is this way or that way. Well, I do know this, that the Jews revered the name. And even in their ceremonies, they did pronounce the name, but there wasn't any sacred name movement in, in the first century. When the Messiah walked, there wasn't a need for it because they revered the name, but to an extreme where now we don't know how to pronounce the name. But we do the best that we can, but I guarantee you the Lord's gonna come and he's gonna instruct us. He's gonna give us the correct pronunciation. All right, I got one more thing to do to you. Yeah, since I'm stirring the pot today. Baptism versus mikvah. We read, I read in my Bible that John was, uh, they even call him John the Baptist. He was going through Judea and baptizing people. But John was not the first one to utilize this ordinance. The church, Christian church calls it an ordinance. He was not the first person to use baptism. When the children of Israel came out of Egypt, the Lord told them to come out and worship him at Mount Sinai. And three days before they were to meet with him, he instructed all of Israel to take a mikvah, to wash their clothes, to bathe their bodies because they were meeting with the king. In Jerusalem, when they did excavations around the Temple Mount area, they found numerous mikvahs because people in the first century, and even today Jews do it, before they went into the temple for worship, they would take a mikvah and then go meet with the king. I'm getting ahead of myself. The Hebrew thought bodies of water were used both literally and figuratively to refer to Sheol, the holding place of the departed. In fact, post-biblical Hebrew uses the word sa'al, to literally mean the deep, referring to the ocean. Thus, passing through or going under the gathered waters of the mikvah symbolizes death, and the reemerging from those same waters is seen as a symbol of resurrection. Long before Messiah entered time and space, Israel was immersed through numerous mikvah. We know that, right? When they left Egypt, they went through a mikvah. And so here's an example. You would come down on the right, so baptism is a or mikvah is a burial and resurrection. You come down and you're, you're descending and you go into the waters of death. And it says this in, 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 in um, Colossians 2. And you come down and you, your sins are washed away. And then when you come up, you ascend and to newness of life. It's, it's, it's reenacting this resurrection. Here's a picture of a mikvah found in Israel uh, that was excavated. There's a difference, though. When you take a mikvah, um, you don't have a pastor that's going to assist you and, and, and bring you down. And some denominations will say, I baptize you now in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. No, we don't, that's not how John was baptizing. That's not how Jews were being mikvahed in the first century. Um, actually, you went into the waters by yourself. John was actually standing on the side of the bank watching whether or not your head went under all the water. You had to, your head, all of your hair had to go under the waters. That's what John was doing. Um, 
when you got, when you take a mikvah, you take off all your jewelry, your makeup, and all your clothes. There should be nothing touching your body but water. There's a big difference. And it has to be living water. It can't be this baptism that we use in Christian churches. That's not, uh, that's not what the rabbis deem as living water. It has to be water coming in and going out. So a lake, some lakes would, 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 would work. The ocean rivers would work. But it, it's representing, again, the living God of Israel. The living Messiah. He's the God of the living, not of the dead. So he, he instructs us to, to, to do this in living water. Okay, I'm almost done. I have one more to go. I could do this all day, but I, I know you guys are getting glassy-eyed. 1 Corinthians 2, 17 through 29. Again, I attend a Christian church on Sundays. Tomorrow I'll be there leading worship. They, they had me teach three, three times, and uh, they, they, they stopped that. Um, anyway, we had here a couple weeks ago, Karen Whitmer, she came and spoke to us about the Great Reset. Karen, Re Karen Whitmer and her husband, Neil. Neil is also an elder at this church. Neil came up to me one day and said, Marcel, I notice that you don't take communion when we do communion at the church. He says, and he said this, he goes, and I know you have a good reason why, can you tell me what it is? And I said, oh, you notice? He goes, yeah, I, I've noticed you don't take communion. In the Christian church, if you don't take communion, there's only one reason normally is that you got some sin. Big sin that won't enable you to take communion. So he said, I know you got a good reason, so what is the reason why you don't take communion? I said, Neil, do you really want to know? He goes, yeah. I said, okay, you're going to be responsible for what you know. Christians will use this 1 Corinthians 2, and I'm going to end with this. When you go to a Christian church, they say this is the Lord's Supper. Anybody ever take this as the Lord's Supper? Yes? Can I just say that ain't supper? That, that, that's a thimble. That, that, that's a cracker. Where I come from, that is not supper. That's not what I, huh? It's okay. It ain't going to fill me up. I'm just saying not, I ain't calling that supper. <laughs> he says here, and he took bread, gave thanks and broke it, gave it to them and saying, this is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. We, we know this, right? And all the tables, community tables have, do this in remembrance of me. And it's a very sacred thing. I'm not making fun of it. It's, it's there. So I, I said, Neil, do you want to know why I don't take communion? He goes, yes. Okay. I said, well, here, let's go to, I said, let's open the scripture. I did this with him. I said, let's go to, I'm, I'm going to tell you exactly what happened. I said, let's go to Luke. So we went to Luke 22. And it says, now the first day of unleavened bread came, on which the Passover lamb was to be sacrificed. So Jesus, Yeshua, sent Kepha, or Peter, and Yachanan, John, saying, go and prepare the what? So everybody say it. The what? For us, so that we may eat it. They say, every time you see that word, you say it out loud. Passover, okay? So go prepare the? For us, so that we may eat it. They said to him, where do you want us to prepare? And he said to them, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet with you will meet you. Follow him into the house that enters. That always troubled me. Why is that important? Why? Anybody could be carrying a pitcher of water. Why if you see a man? Well, in, in the first century, in Israel, it was uncommon for a man to go fetch water. It was a female job. It was considered. So to see a man walking with a pitcher of water is like, that's unusual. Okay? So here's what they had to go look, and they found this guy. And you shall say to the owner of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room in which I may eat the? Can you say it louder? I eat the? With my disciples. And he will show you a large furnished upstairs room, the upper room. Prepare it there. Prepare what? The? And they left and found everything just as he had told them. And they prepared the? Ah, it's right there. When the hour came, he reclined at the table. Only free men recline at the table. It's a sign that you're free. And these guys were reclining. And, 
and the apostles with them. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. Whoa, it's getting good. And for I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on or on, on until the king then when God comes, and when he has taken some of the bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is being given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And I said, Deal. After reading this, it's all about context, context, context. What is the this in that statement? And he goes, Communion. <laughs> I'm like, Neil. No. No, what's the this? When he says, whenever, whenever you do this, do this in remembrance of me. What's the this? He says, communion, Marshall. That's communion. I said, no, Neil. What did the Messiah say? And then this look came over his face. He's like, oh, Passover. And I said, yeah, and how many times a year do you do Passover? Oh. Now, is there anything wrong with eating some bread? Drinking some wine? Not at all. When we, when we open up, you know, um, when we have um, the opening ceremonies open up this, the Sabbath, you use, you know, the bread and the wine. That's a good thing. But the idea that God created this ordinance called communion is nowhere to be found in the Bible. It's just not there. Let me give you an example of what the... Uh, uh, a Passover, the Lord's Supper looks like, that's a meal. That's not a cracker. That's a meal. Last couple of hours. My first, my first example, my first taking of, of Pesach, the Seder meal, it lasted three or four hours. We had a lot of wine. We had a lot of lamb and beef and chicken. We had everything. We, we, just, we, we filled ourselves. So when, when I go to my Christian church and they say, the Lord's Supper, I'm like, this is a different idea of what the supper would, would be like. Okay, I'm going to end with this. i got to end this. And then the thought hit me. I'm a simple guy, like I said. Every time I see scriptures like this in Ezra, O Lord, the God of Israel. O Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God of Israel. He doesn't say, oh, the God of the Greeks. The God of the Babylonians, the God of the Hittites, he says, the God of Israel. You are just, for we are left a remnant that has escaped as it is today. Behold, we are before you in our guilt, for none can stand before you because of this, O Lord, Adonai, the Elohim of Yisrael. He's the God of Israel. And if you are a part of Am Yisrael, the the people of Israel, then he is your God. In Luke, it says, Blessed be Adonai, the Lord, Elohim of Yisrael, for he has visited and redeemed his people. Yes, he has visited. And he's coming back again. Psalm 41, Blessed be Yahweh, the God, the Elohim of Yisrael. The Elohim of Yisrael. He identifies himself as the God of Israel. You know, this, this, there's a law, I've already mentioned this many times, there's a law when you start doing homiletics, when you start doing any kind of study of theology, it's called the law of first mention. I was told growing up that the church was started in 30 AD at, at, at this act of Pente Pentecost. Then I find out that it really was started 300, 400 years later. But even before I realized that, I found this scripture, which started the whole thing. It says, this is the one who was in the assembly. See, it says, A, there's a footnote there. He was in the assembly in the wilderness together with the angel who spoke to him at length at Mount Sinai and who was with our fathers, and he received living words to pass on to you. Hmm. Well, when you look at the footnote, Some, some translation says, this is the one who was in the church in the wilderness. But it's, 
This is the one who was in the called out assembly in the wilderness. So the first mention of a assembly or church was found back in Exodus. This is referring to Exodus. And it's found in Acts. And they're even referencing back what happened back in Exodus. So that's the first mention. So how could the church start in 30 AD if it was already in existence back in Exodus? And this is it. This is where I want to end. So I talked about Christians, whom I've always identified as. I've talked about Jews. But who do you identify as? Are you a Christian? Are you a Hebraic roots person? We have all these different terms. Are you a Messianic Jew? Are you all of these terms? Well, let me leave you, leave you with this. In Revelation 12, it says, The dragon was infuriated over the woman and went off to fight the rest of her children. So the, 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 the dragon was beat up. He was beat. And he was infuriated by kick, being kicked out of heaven. And so he decided, I'm going to go and attack the children of Yahweh. Those who obey. And here, here's the, the defining items about who these people are. They are noted as people who obey God's commands and bear witness to Yeshua. Two things. Testimony of Yeshua on their lips, right? And they keep his commandments. Not one or the other. Both. Well, look. Jews, they have the commandments. They follow the commandments. They keep kosher. They keep the feast days. They have the Torah. They have the teaching and instruction. That's what Torah means, teaching and instruction. But they don't have the testimony of Yeshua. They don't believe he's come yet. And you have Christians. They have the testimony of, of Jesus. Jesus, they're, they're going to confess him. They always, I mean, that's all we did. We, I'm a believer. I believe in Christ. Yeah, I'll believe that. But I, they were also taught that they're not under the law, that they don't have to follow those old antiquated laws. So they have the testimony, but they don't have the word, the commandments, I should say, the instructions. Then you have people who are called messianic. They believe in the Messiah. And according to Revelation there, 12, they have the testimony of Yeshua on their lips, and they keep the command. Is that you? Is that you? Yes. yes. And you might be a Messianic Jew. <laughs> That's one way to describe it. It's not a bad thing. Um, in, you know, in the first century also, they had a symbol in the Greek. It, 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 it meant fish. And so they would use this symbol as a fish. But also they, they knew their Jewish roots Hebraic roots. And this is how you get this symbol. This symbol was found in the grotto of one of the disciples in Jerusalem, and this is what it looks like. You see how you get it? So you have the, the idea about the, receiving the Messiah, but you have your, your Hebraic heritage. And when you combine them, that's called the Messianic seal. That was found in Jerusalem. I wanted to show you that. That's why it looks the way it does. That's what it's saying. They have their roots in the Messiah. They believe. And, and that, that fish is also called the ictus. You'll see it on a lot of people's cars, maybe some of your cars. You're walking around with that, that, that sign. When you combine them, you, you have the Messianic seal. So if Messiah comes back, will you recognize him? Will you identify with him? What about if he looked like this? Would you receive him? Because the Messiah is the living word of God. He is the, the Messiah, the Mashiach, the anointed one. That's what Mashiach. Mashiach means the anointed one. That's what Christ means in English, the anointed ones. And 
if you're a Christian, it means you are one of those anointed ones of the Messiah. And if you're a messianic, you're one of the anointed ones of the Mashiach. It's not a bad word, but it's how you identify yourself. I didn't tell you all these things to create division. Can I just tell you that? I'm telling you these things because it's our history. It's part of your history. And when I talk to many of you, um, I get the same type of story. You know, uh, I was talking to Mathis. Can I say that? I, I'm going to just call you out. Mathis uh, moved here. He did something very courageous. I don't know if you've met. Did y'all meet Mathis during the, during the, you know, when I told you to go meet somebody? Did anybody go say hi to him? Oh, one, per, one person. Nanita, okay, so Mathis and his wife, Casey, they moved here from Ohio. They moved to God's country. <laughs> and they came out of a Catholic, well, their, their family's Catholic, distinctly Catholic. Is that correct? Did they um, embrace your decision? Did they think you're joining a cult? We do have snakes in the back. We can pull those out. <laughs> so you, I mean, I, I'm going to put you on the spot. Why did you decide to make this decision to, to come here? Okay, can we get a microphone on him? I want to hear what he got to say. I'm putting him on the spot. I'm so sorry to do this to you. Um, I just felt it was, was the right thing to do. Thought I was pulled this way. Nothing. Who got exciting. to you? Was was it? What, what, What's that? Who got to you? What do you mean? Somebody had to tell you. Oh, give her, give her the microphone. Give her the microphone. No, do not give. Her. So, how did you discuss this with with Mathis? Uh, this is Chris, by the way. Yeah, it, it was Carrie's fault. I'd oh say. no. <laughs> Uh, get, come on, get the microphone, Carrie. This is getting longer than I thought. So, <laughs> Carrie started it? Uh, Who? <clears throat> oh, okay. Boom. All right, Carrie, explain what happened here. Yeah, I, we sat down for a couple hours, talked about Bible stuff. Mm, that's pretty much it. That's your answer? Yep. So you told these Catholics about Yeshua? Yes, I did. And you told them about the feast days? I did. And they didn't run in horror? Nope. You want to elaborate on I'm giving you a chance to elaborate <laughs> on that. Uh, well, they were willing to hear, and that's the key. I think it's the willingness of the heart to be able to be open to his word and the truth of it and not defend your, where you stand. So, so during the week, I work in a, in a business, and I come in there, and Mathis works there, and I come in there, he always has these earbuds, and I ask him, I say, hey, what are you listening to today? What are you listening to? I'm listening to Torah. What do you, what's the, what's the rabbi you listen to? Tom Bradford. Tom, Tom Bradford. He's got Tom Bradford on, and he's listening to Tom Bradford. And he's moved here with his, with his wife, lovely wife. And, and to be a part of this assembly, so to learn more. And he, he's not the only one. Many of you have the same testimony, but he's being shunned by his family. Is that the word? That's not the Amish word. You're, you're, you're shunned because you're not following the tenets of Catholicism anymore. Is that right, Casey? Yeah. And yet you're still worth it? I didn't see uh, Matthias. Oh, he said, okay. <laughs> and that's who we are. We're just a group of people from various backgrounds, Catholicism, Christianity, um, and every, everything under the sun, you can believe. Um, when I talk to you, I hear a varied uh, uh, reports of what you came out of and what you endured. 
to come here to be a part of a, of a body of believers, an assembly. Yeah, peculiar people. <laughs> we put the P in peculiar, I tell you that. Um, but I do know this, that the Bible says that the Messiah is coming back. We, we, we know he has come, that he's coming back. And we do know this, that when he comes back, he's going to teach us all things. So whatever we're lacking now, maybe we don't know how to pronounce the sacred name correctly. Maybe we don't do, you know, um, kosher just exactly like the Lord would have us do. Maybe we don't observe the Sabbath correctly, like, you know, maybe the Lord's going to teach us something else about that. There are a lot of things the Lord's going to teach us. But I, I, you know what I'm so excited about is the fact that we're here, that the Lord chose us because narrow is the path that leads to life. Few find it, but, but, but you're part of the few. And, and you're willing to learn, and you're willing to put aside your, 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 your pet mm, theologies to come and be a part of assembly and worship the God of Israel. And in so doing, we have one identity, one banner, and that banner is Christ. That banner is Yeshua. That banner is our Messiah. That banner is the God who unites us, and that's the unifying element of our identity. I don't identify um, by what the world claims, you know, to be identity. I, identify, I find my identity in him. Ultimately, my identity, your identity, is found only in him. Amen? <laughs>